Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pints with Aquinas. In this episode, I thought that we could talk about the theory of evolution and the way in which we as believers engage with the theory of evolution. Why? Well, uh, because a lot of people have asked questions about it, because it's an interesting theme, and because while I myself am in no wise an expert on the theme, there are other authors, you know, other thinkers who are working on it nowadays, um, and their resources are super helpful for sorting out the harmony of faith and science in this particular issue. So I thought that I could direct your attention to some of their good work. So yeah, here we go. We can begin with a basic affirmation of the harmony of faith and science. So because reality is one, truth is one. By that I mean because reality is what it is, and because we are made as we are made, we have access to that reality. Now, albeit we are weak and wounded, and as a result, we have kind of like limited access to that reality. That being said, though, we can affirm that if we gain access to reality, that access will correspond to other genuine access to reality. So what we're saying here is there's no like double truth theory, like this is true in faith and this is true in science, but they're not true with respect to each other. That's false, right? Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas argued vehemently against that in the 13th century, and we want to do the same in the 21st. So if there are genuine findings of science, they're going to correspond to or be harmonious with the genuine findings of faith. So when we work out a theory of evolution, then we're going to have to, you know, understand how this fits within a worldview of God and his creation, the ongoing work of governance and providence. And that's effectively what we're doing here, just kind of giving some basic sketches, basic arguments along those lines. And in the process, we're going to want to push back against a certain scientism, which says all you need to explain reality is science. And if anything else makes an attempt to explain reality, it ought to be rebuffed because it's violent or stupid or whatever. Um, so that's just that's just nonsense. Science is good within its limits, within its bounds. But when it gets too big for its britches, which is something that no one said in a billion years, um, then we start to have problems. And that's what we have with scientism, this kind of uh, global claim to competence, which is just it's not proper to the scientific disciplines. And what we find within theory of evolution is a certain neo-Darwinism. Uh, which which follows this tack of scientism. So it's it's an attempt on the part of evolutionary theory to explain everything. And as a result, it indulges in a kind of um, reductionism, a methodological reductionism, which rules everything else, like rules everything else out to court. Uh, so, so we don't want to do that, or we want to identify that when it's happening, um, and then, uh, yeah, kind of push back against it or rebuke it soundly. So some basic theological principles that we bring to bear on this particular issue, that's how we'll start, basic theological principles. And then I'll just talk a little bit about evolution, cognizant of the fact that I, that I don't have competence in this particular zone. And then just talk a little bit about what that might mean for a theory of our original parents. Okay, so those are the three points that I hope to progress through. So the first, basic theological principles. I'm hitting things on this desk. Um, first, we want to just affirm, you know, the doctrine of creation. When we talk about the doctrine of creation, we're talking about the dependency of all created things on God for their being and their acting. So God creates all things to be and to act in a way proper to its nature, and he continues to give that being and acting throughout the course of the thing's existence, okay? So all things rely upon God for their being and their acting. And we also want to affirm that God creates perfectly, all right? Sometimes when you hear evolution, it's like, it's, it's described as if it were improving upon God's, you know, God's creative act. Um, but what we're talking about when we talk about creation is a perfect creation on the, power, on the part of God, which wills all things individually and concretely and meaningfully. All right? But something that's awesome, uh, if you take your cue from St. Thomas Aquinas of the Doctrine of Creation, is that creation is an ongoing phenomenon. Sometimes when you hear creation described, it's like a beginning point when God snapped his fingers and sent a bunch of things kind of hurtling from his divine will. But such is not the case with St. Thomas Aquinas. He sees creation as an ever-present and ongoing reality. And then within the setting of this theory of creation, we can see evolution as subordinated to God's will for each and individual thing. So it's not as if like God does a thing and then like evolution takes over. It's not as if God does a thing that was purposeful and meaningful at the outset, but then, you know, subsequently. So what we're talking about here is a simple affirmation of the doctrine of creation. 
And so when we put that in dialogue with evolution, we're going to say that God creates in and through evolution according to his providence, all right? And his providence is such that, that each thing acts or each thing operates according to its proper principles. So it's not as if God is like a celestial puppet master who creepily manipulates and controls all things according to his divine plan, but it's that God gives each thing a nature and with its nature comes a certain mode or manner of operation and that God is working in and through that nature and that manner and mode of operation because he wills it to be and he wills it to continue to be all right so so evolution is part of that story it's not an exception right it's not uh in in contrast to or it's not in conflict with it's part of the story um and and god one might argue in affording for a dispensation or creating a dispensation in which evolution takes place actually gives greater dignity to creation because he he yeah imparts to it a kind of capacity to be part of the unfolding of creation it's not as if God is like individual thing, individual thing, individual thing, individual thing. Now don't move. Individual thing. In, no, okay. So God is creating, but he's creating a creation which operates by a certain dynamism so that it itself is part of the story of creation. Now, on the one hand, we're not saying that there's ministerial creation. That's a bigger concern. And you can see St. Thomas's arguments against that in Prima Pars question 45. But we are saying that we as creatures have a kind of dignity of causing which makes us more like God this is part of his plan so boom not scandalized by that fact um, and also that within the context of evolution we can see God's glory right God's God's plan as it were for the manifestation and communication of his divine life not only in one particular time right synchronically but also throughout time which is to say diachronically and evolution gives us a sense for the scope and grandeur of his glory which is kind of awesome all right. So when we talk about randomness or when we talk about natural selection, we're talking about it as situated within God's plan and God's providence. We're talking about it as subordinated to an intention or a deliberate will for his glory in this manifest and communicable fashion. All right. So like when we say randomness in a scientific sense, we're talking about uncorrelated. But when we talk about God's providence, we're talking about how God orchestrates all things to, you know, go forth from him and return to him whilst providing for their individual natures and operations. So each thing operates in the way that's proper to it. And that leaves each thing kind of like free, as it were, or just free, right, to operate according with to, you know, its, its, its particular nature and operation. All right. So um, the next thing then is we want to make a, a basic affirmation about the nature of the human soul. So you'll hear Christian thinkers affirm an ontological difference between lower creation and then man and angels, okay? On account of the fact that we have immortal souls, we have immaterial souls, which are thereby immortal. So St. Thomas, you know, finds a cool proof for, or what he takes to be a cool proof for the immateriality and thus the immortality of the human soul in Aristotle's De Anima 3.5. So St. Thomas picks this up, Cajetan and the subsequent tradition kind of perfects this argument. But basically, like, we, we see in the human soul certain capacities, right, certain evidences of life which go beyond material creation. And so we make a judgment as to the nature of that soul, namely, that it is immaterial. Okay, so um, there are types of operations which issue from the human soul, namely intellect and will, um, to types of conceptualizations or types of, um, yeah, ratiocinations, which go beyond the limits of matter. And so we make a judgment that this soul is an immaterial soul. And because it's not material, it, it, it doesn't die. It doesn't have parts. There's no prospect of disintegration. And we have clarification, you know, of this fact from, you know, revelation and our theological musings on that revelation. So there's a real difference between lower creation, right? So plants and animals have souls, but they'd be like vegetative or sensory souls, which are adduced from matter, okay? So they're, they're wholly bound up with matter. They don't have a power which transcends the matter in which it's situated like the intellect and will. And as a result of which, those souls perish with the matter itself. So when a dog dies, its soul passes out um, or it passes from existence. Whereas in our case, when our body decomposes, uh, our, our soul perdures because it's immaterial and thus immortal, etc. So there's an ontological difference between lower creation and then man and angels. But specifically here, we're concerned about man. And then in the philosophical tradition and in the church's kind of reception of the philosophical tradition, there's a kind of concern that we don't, yeah, we don't speak, what, science fictionally about the way that, that higher things come to be. All right. So in general, we would say that the, the higher doesn't come from the lower, 
Like, we wouldn't say that things are just getting better and better and better. That there's an intervention, there's a causal intervention, which brings about a higher thing from lower material considerations or lower factors. So when we're talking about then the human soul, we wouldn't say that the human soul evolves. Rather, it comes from God, right? It has a divine source, all right? And we can see this especially in light of the fact that our original parents were, their souls were concreated with grace, which itself is, you know, the divine life. And that we were created with a supernatural destiny. So we have minds with which to know, hearts with which to love. Those minds and hearts are for God. We are shot towards God at our creation. And we aren't satisfied except in the knowledge and love of him. So the human soul is a particular type of creation insofar as it has, you know, this, this supernatural destiny. Insofar as it's set apart from lower creation by an ontological difference. And then lastly, we need to account for human sin and its propagation or transmission. All right, so... When thinking about the commission, especially of the original sin and the forgiveness thereof, we as, you know, uh, the people of God look to Romans 5, verses 12 through 21, about this, this sin of the one man, which is atoned for uh, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it seems like the solidarity that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ is, in a certain sense, contingent upon the solidarity that we have in the sin of Adam. So, because we are all fallen, we all, and we are all fallen of the same stock, right? We're all present in the loins of Adam, the choice of Adam, as it were, the seed of Adam. And that human nature is communicated to us downstream of his original sin, our first parent's original sin, um, despoiled of grace and wounded in nature, right? Because we don't have rectitude, but rather experience the privation of that rectitude or original justice with the wounds of ignorance and malice and weakness and concupiscence, okay? We stand in need of a redemption, all right? We, we come into this world left to ourselves and we look to our Lord Jesus Christ. But, but what we're saying here is that there is a human sin which we have all taken part in. And that has to have been true at the beginning. And then to assure the fact that all human beings will profit from this salvation on account of the fact that they have all fallen in in Adam and Eve. So, uh, yeah, when we're talking about like corporate sin, things kind of get weird. Like, how do you, how do you account for a corporate sin? So the church is very sensible in its meditation on this particular theme about the commission of that sin, the universe, universality of that sin and how Christ, you know, kind of speaks a word into it. So, uh, yes, this is the kind of basic theological landscape. I realize like I'm gesticulating wildly, which I should probably discipline my hands for the rest of this video. Um, this is the theological landscape in which we, we kind of engage with the theory of evolution in the context of the life of faith. But, but you know, like it seems, and you know, I'm thinking here of a comment by St. John Paul II, apropos of the theme, um, that, that you know, the theory of evolution is, is beyond theory at this point. It seems borne out by scientific fact, um, and that as a result of which, we as Christians uh, are responsible for thinking about it well, lest our seeming reticence, right, would pose a kind of scandal. And because we're concerned to know the truth. And if the truth is symphonic, right, if there is just the one reality which bears the one truth, then we shouldn't fear that this is going to cause us problems when it comes to our belief, rather that it will actually strengthen our belief if we engage with it. So, yeah, it seems like evolution is borne out by certain evidence in genes insofar as, you know, like a genetic code comes to us in the same language across species and that genetic code is interrelated across species. Uh, you can think about this at the level of like organismal biology, right? You've probably heard about vestigial organs um, and I'm not going to list them because then the abundance of my ignorance will be borne out. I can't help myself. I'm going to help myself. Okay. So like organs, which formerly had a purpose at certain times in our evolutionary history, but have ceased to have the same kind of importance. And so they're being, um, kind of like sorted out as it were, or they're being selected out. I think like, Oh, stop it. I said, I wasn't going to. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then evidence in the fossil record, like where you would expect to find progressive speciation, we often will find fossils which bear out that there has in fact been progressive speciation, that there's a bridge, you know, between a more primitive and then a more advanced species, or that there's a bridge in what we would expect evolutionarily. And then we find evidence elsewhere. So this would be like basic things. So uh, when we talk about evolution, right, we're just yeah, again, just disciplining the theory so that way it doesn't get into these kind of crazy atheistic or scientistic neo-Darwinist um, uh, proportions. What we're talking about here is this notion that uh, all biological life has evolved, right, to account for its differentiation and speciation, and that that occurs at a genetic level on the basis of certain behaviors which are propagated through a species, um, not just in one, you know, like not, we're not talking about 
that like one animal changes within the context of its life. We're talking about a species, which is selected on account of certain random genetic mutations, some of which are promoted and some of which are demoted in light of behavioral advantages or disadvantages. That's all we're talking about. Okay. So then, um, talking then a little bit more about us as human beings, our original parents and an original sin, what are some good theories as to how this might be true, especially in light of Humani Generis, published in the middle of the 20th century, which expresses a certain reticence about uh, this type of, um, yeah, what would you say, this type of uh, speculation? So it seems like the out of Africa theory has, you know, kind of theoretical teeth. Uh, that anatomically modern humans arise between, you know, 200,000 and 150,000 years ago, and that behaviorally modern humans arise between like 100,000 and 75,000 years ago, and that this community migrates out of Africa and then populates the earth beginning about 60,000 years ago, where it would have like started breeding with, you know, Denisovians and Neanderthals. Um, now, when we look at our present genetic diversity, it seems that the human population probably never bottle it never bottlenecked more narrowly than like 10,000 breeding pairs in order to uh, get the type of genetic diversity which we see now in the human community. Um, so then the question is how might this have happened? How could it have happened that we have an original pair who commit an original sin, which original sin propagates throughout the entire species when you know you have behaviorally modern humans in Africa prior to their migration the you know, bottlenecking of which community never gets narrower than like 10,000 breeding pairs. So you have a lot of people. How do you account for the fact that they all partake of the one sin? And you have different theories about this. The ones that I've read are those of um, the work uh, Thomistic Evolution, which is headed up by Father Nicanor Ostriaco, and you can find that at ThomisticEvolution.org. Okay. Um, and then I read an article in the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly by Kenneth Kemp on this particular theme. So my thoughts are are seasoned by those contributions, but undoubtedly there are others, there are more. But I'm just going to kind of reduce that to a basic impartable nugget, which is that it seems there, there, there might have been some kind of, like, or there may have been some kind of genetic mutation or change, some kind of evolution in the human species, which predisposed, as it were, for the reception of the rational soul. Um, so Father Nicanor Ostriaco speculates that it has something to do with our capacity for language, okay? And that this genetic mutation would have been communicated to subsequent generations of those who inherited the mutation, all right? So it would have propagated downstream of the species. So even while you look around and you see what are effectively, you know, anatomically and, um, yeah, just like kind of sight test, you know, homo sapiens, you know, but that within that community, you have certain advances which give certain individuals an adaptive advantage over all of their contemporaries within that community because they now have a capacity for language, conceptualization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or they have the material conditions for that, okay? So then, drawing then from Kenneth Kemp, he talks about how we can distinguish between a biological species and then a theological species. So he says, within this polygenistic, right, this many-paired um, human community, God would have selected an original pair in whom he infused a rational soul. And if you bring in some of the thoughts here from Father Nicanor Ostriaco, it seems like there would have been material conditions which would have disposed for this. Material conditions subject to the providence of God, right? So we're not talking about randomness that is a scandal against the providence of God, but we're talking about something situated within. So something that would have predisposed for that infusion of a human soul. Okay, so that would have constituted then a theological human being. All right, so you have the biological species, right, which is to say you have a homo sapien, and then you have the theological species wherein God infuses the human soul. And then Father Nicanor and Kenneth Kemp would argue that all the subsequent generations of that pair would have partaken of, you know, this genetic mutation and this human soul, which had been infused by God and then would have been infused in subsequent generations of that community, like of, the, of that particular breeding pair. So then you can have an original sin committed by this pair, even within a broader community, all right? And that that sin would have propagated with the capacity for language and the infusion of the human soul, right? And with the human soul and its powers uh, through the subsequent community, along with the guilt incurred thereby. And that on account of the fact that they were adaptively um, kind of beyond their contemporaries, they would have outbred 
or outviolenced or outmuscled their contemporaries such that all subsequent generations of human beings would have been direct descendants of this pair, that the others who had not had this mutation and the infusion of this soul would have been, as it were, killed off or incorporated into the community uh, through mating, which is to say through bestiality, which is a crazy part of that story. Um, so, okay, again, candid admission that I am not a master of this particular um, theme and that I don't understand it entirely well. But I do want to direct you to the resources of those who do understand it better. So my sincere apologies for faults that I've committed or scientific infelicities that I've stumbled into unawares. But you can look at ThomisticEvolution.org and then the work of Kenneth Kemp in that one article, but presumably there are other contributions that he's made on this particular theme. And then if you go to the Thomistic Institute website, or if you search in the Thomistic Institute podcast, there have been a lot of lectures on this issue. And I'm thinking here of lectures by... Uh, Professor Jim Madden in particular. So I hope that that's helpful for you when thinking about this theme, but I just wanted to set out, again, theological principles, just a little bit about the theory of evolution, and then how that affects our understanding of the infusion of the human soul, human sin, its propagation, and how we can situate that within the theory such that the harmony of the truth is spotlighted and we as Christians are able to, you know, make a genuine contribution and pro yeah, progress in our understanding and communication of the truth. So boom, that is what I wanted to share. Uh, again, this is Pints with Aquinas. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please do push the bell and then get updates on further videos that come out. And then if you haven't yet, check out God's Planning, which is a podcast to which I contribute with uh, four other Dominican friars with conversations about all kinds of Catholic themes, the occasional guest, special series, Lexio Divina. You'll find all kinds of things there from which you will profit, I hope. And then lastly, I wrote a book. It's called Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly. It's been out for a couple months now. And um, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and maybe how it can be improved upon so that way we can together, you know, progress in our knowledge and love of the truth of, of, of what is good and beautiful. All right, so uh, my prayers are for you. Please pray for me. And I will look forward to chatting with you next time on Pints with Aquinas.